They are the technologies that everyone passes over because you look at them and you think that's just rubbish. That will never change the world. But you combine it with other things and you get some interesting stuff. On the bottom of the, uh, the chart, we have machine systems. So that's uh, kind of a really usual technology. That's things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, quantum computing, DNA computing, chemical computing, molecular computing. So as we start coming to the end of Moore's law with silicon-based computing, we have optic-based computing, we have DNA computing already starting to come through, at least as an architecture, and a DNA computer makes a quantum computer look like a rock. Bearing in mind that today's quantum computers are around 100 million times faster than yesterday's logic-based computers. So we have all sorts of things coming down the line. Now, today when we talk about disruption, one of the biggest problems that people have is trying to, trying to decode it. Now, if we have a look in the past, these are called S-curves. The bottom of the S-curve is where a particular technology just totters along the bottom. You know, someone's discovered it, it's being iterated very slowly. Then you have a, an acceleration curve, so this is where it now starts taking off. And then it starts maturing, and eventually it starts to die. So that's the top of the S-curve. If I went into any boardroom about 10 years ago and said, tell me about the things that are going to disrupt you. Particularly a technology organization, they would say, well, in 18 months' time, we're going to see a doubling in chip performance, and we're going to see the cost of chips come down. They might have talked about exponential technologies in terms of communications, hard drive, storage, that kind of thing. But you could predict all that because it was fairly straightforward and you could see it. So if I said to you, as a business, if I gave you twice the amount of computing power at the same price, what would that mean to your business? Well, you could run better analytics, you could do a variety of things, but you can map that out. The biggest issue that we have today, and this is why disruption is hitting every industry, not just the transportation industry we're talking about today, because there's not one, there's not two, there's not three. There's about 20 significant ones. And when you start overlaying all of these, so if you have a look just in the world of transportation, you can 3D print cars. You can use artificial intelligence to create self-driving cars. You can use augmented reality to design your cars. You can stick your Toyotas on a blockchain so they start telling you when they're failing. They self-insure, they do all sorts of things. You have bots. You can order your car up using an Uber app. You have machine vision. Artificial intelligence combined with machine vision changes the world. You have problems. Again, one of those technologies that people will look at and say, so what? But today's new polymers coming out of the UK mean that you can charge your fancy electric car in 15 seconds and it can drive 400 miles and you can replace the lithium ion industry. So don't, don't count just single technologies out. Quantum computing, if you have vast fleets of self-driving cars and you want to make sure that they are going in the right direction using the most optimal routes, you use quantum computing. And then we have sensors, solar power, superconductors and all sorts of other bits and pieces. So what I want to walk through now is this. Today we already know how to make a deflector shield. You fire a laser as part of the atmosphere, you create something called a Fermi lens, you've created the deflector shield. We've already demonstrated tractor beams using light and sound. We did that two years ago, both across Europe and in New York. We can 3D print food, and actually we can 3D print food that looks a lot better than this. We can also grow clean meat in bioreactors. So if you want to fill in steak that has never come from a cow, we can do that today. And the FDA has just approved that in New York. So you can walk into a restaurant, buy a fillet steak. It is a fillet steak. It's not a synthetic mock-up. It is a fillet steak because we're using stem cells of bioreactor. Suddenly you get rid of the cows and the cattle. We've created completely new forms of life. So we've now created bacteria and viruses that have six nucleotide bases, not four. 
All of us on the planet share the same, share the same genetic code. And we share the same genetic code and makeup that the dinosaurs had. This is completely new life. And then, since we're talking about transportation, we can sequence life, we can digitize it, we can email it to a 3D printer with a genetic sequencing machine and a 3D printing machine on the other end. And that could be either in the next room or it could be on Mars. And then we could do something really interesting. We can teleport life. Maybe not necessarily in the traditional Star trek -y way, but this is now being demonstrated. So you take, as I said, you digitize life, because we digitize the genetic code, you send it to an email to a printer, basically it's in a particular room, it prints out, and viruses are actually qualified, qualifies life, apparently. So despite all of that though, we're living in a world that is increasingly full of science fact and a little bit less science fiction. But how many of you, when you were younger, were playing with yeah, rockets? And, uh, yeah, <coughs> hands up. Yeah, I know, see, there you go. So, as kids, we played with rockets, we played with cars. You know, if you, like my kids, play with Hot Wheels and you're flying them around. Yeah, and uh, the kids come over to you and say, oh, my daddy, what's the future look like? And you say, well, you know, son, when you're a little bit older, you'll be uh, flying in a rocket ship, uh, you'll be visiting the moon, and uh, you'll, be in a, you'll be in a flying car. It'll be amazing. Is that what you're all told? In the future, there are going to be rockets to the moon, and you know, it's going to be great times when we're talking about the traffic. So, at what point did this turn into that? Smog-filled cities. Legacy trains that keep getting jammed up and bogged up as you're travelling at 30 miles an hour as you're on the, on the UK London line. Traffic jams as long as you're on. Sleeping in your car in a, tra in a traffic jam. But at, least the, uh, at least there's comedy on tap. So, as children, basically, we were painting, painting this great vision of what transportation was going to be and what it was going to do for us. And actually, reality sucks. You know, we get stuck in gridlock, and frankly, most of us hate it. Now, as a futurist, this is where I should really be saying what we should be all be doing is we should be strapping on virtual reality masks, using 360-degree cameras, and just living life on the sofa. But the reason we want to travel, the reason that we put up with the pain that we do today, isn't because we want to sit on a sofa in some digital reality. It's because we want to go there. We want to experience that. That's why we put up with the travel chaos. So what does the future actually look like? The future of transportation is actually very, very easy. It's like the future of money. The future of money is digital with a variety of different formats. So, the future of transportation isn't really that much different. Firstly, you get rid of the driver, pilot, whatever it happens to be. Secondly, you shove a load of batteries into the device, into the vehicle, so we now have electric vehicles. That's pretty much it. You might want to put your vehicles onto the blockchain and do some other sort of fancy things, but fundamentally, get rid of the driver, turn your vehicle electric, Fully autonomous cars and vehicles and bits and pieces, done. Future of transportation in five seconds. However, when we first saw electric cars, they were a little bit gimmicky. They looked a little bit like this. And as we started having a look at the cars that we wanted to buy, and as the eco warriors said, go out and buy an electric smart car. You'll do, you'll do good for the environment. Lots of people went, I want to do good for the environment, but you know, I kind of like my BMW 5 Series, I like my Mercedes AMG, you know, not quite for me, but you know, hey, everyone else, feel free to go and buy one, you know, the old Priuses and all that sort of stuff. So we were sort of in this sort of love-hate with, um, with electric vehicles, you know, the range wasn't that good, they didn't really look that great, they were a bit gimmicky, they looked like something that you call now, basically, wouldn't think it was cool. 
But now, as we start tipping, getting to a tipping point with electric vehicles, the vehicles themselves are getting a little bit cooler. This is Aston Martin's full EV. Which one do you want to buy? That one? That one. Or even better, which one do you want to use as a service? Because you don't have to buy cars anymore. Now, all this talk of uh, electric vehicles in the UK, Germany, France, India and China, they have now banned the sale of combustion engine vehicles from 2030 to 2040. We are now going into a world where half the people on the planet will not be able to buy a combustion engine car because the regulators and the government will not allow it. So what do you start thinking that does when you for electric vehicle development? It accelerates it. However, with all these cars that are now starting to plug into the grid, we're fundamentally changing the nature of the electricity grid. So these Tesla battery packs have something called tied storage. They feed renewable energy into the house, but they also feed energy back into the grid. So increasingly, we are seeing distributed renewable energy grids, smart grids pop up, etc., etc. Now, at the moment, 0.1% of all the cars on the road in the world are electric. There are about a billion cars on the road. If 1% of those cars becomes electric, the price of oil never recovers. Period. Because it's like the crash of 2008. By 2040, depending on you know, different analyst estimates, but bearing in mind that the regulators have now said you cannot buy a combustion engine vehicle from these particular dates, by 2040, there's a general estimate that between 30 to 50% of all cars on the road will be electric. And in some countries, that will be much higher. Norway, for example, already has a very high percentage of electric cars. So, if you've invested trillions of dollars in oil, refineries, all this kind of stuff, and we're now switching to renewables, which, by the way, are the cheapest form of energy in 58 countries, so renewables no longer have the shackles they said that we thought they did, you might want to think about switching industries. And of course, as we start moving into the world of self-driving vehicles, certainly one of my predictions is that the car disappears. Because if you get rid of the steering wheel and you need the regulators to allow you to get rid of the steering wheels and the brakes, you end up with this kind of thing. Is this a car? Or is it a pod? Or is it waiting for a marketing slogan? So, as we start on our journey, we will inevitably see the death of the car, because the car will become a pod, or whatever it ends up getting called. But it's not just cars. We already have self-driving semi-trucks, and we've already had lots of self-driving semi-trucks platooning around Europe. Uh, in America, they've already made their first deliveries, and they're actually good. We've got self-driving buses, electric, obviously, this is Rio Tinto's fully autonomous train. It's the first in the world and it came out this week. So Rio Tinto, BHP, Billiton, when we have a look at the mining industry, for example, they're almost now 100% automated. All the way from the coal face down the bottom of the mine, all the way through to delivery. This is a 250 ton mining truck. It's self-driving but it's also the world's largest electric vehicle. So there are no corner of transportation that's being left untouched. Talking about planes, by 2030 we should start seeing the first electric regional aircraft, because trying to turn an aircraft like an A380 into a fully electric aircraft is a bit tricky. So we're starting with regional planes, that's the likes of Rolls Royce, GE, Pratt Whitney, that kind of stuff. Um, EasyJet are in on it as well, if anyone flies EasyJet. By 2030 we'll also see the first fully autonomous planes. Now for those of you who sort of fly a lot like me, uh, we already know basically that the pilot pushes a button, the plane takes off, it pushes another button, the plane lands, and fly by wire. But when Boeing, Lockheed and all these other organisations, Airbus, talk about taking the pilot out of the cockpit, they mean taking the pilot out of the cockpit. But the problem that you have, taking a human out of a driver's seat or a pilot's seat, 
is what happens if two ducks go into those engines? Will the AI be able to land the plane by itself, like sort of Sully did, let's say, out in New York? And the general, the general theory at the moment is no. So trying to automate 99% of all of our journeys using self-driving things is actually very easy. When it's perfect conditions, it's easy. We can do it already. It's trying to automate that last 1% that gets the regulators itchy. And that's why we don't see some of these self-driving things on the, on the roads at the moment. We also have new forms of, uh, of, uh, of transportation coming up. Uh, this is a new innovative dog walking uh, service basically from a company in Finland. Uh, and I think it'll catch on. So we have delivery drones. I think the dog's liking that. And uh, as I've been walking around, I've been hearing lots of people saying, I wish there was a flying car.
essentially bore about 750 miles worth of tonnes, which would take about 8 to 10 years and cost $38 billion. Um, and I'm not really sure that you'd actually want to put, put cars in those tunnels uh, for a start. However, as we start looking at some of the more futuristic modes of transport now, we have Loop Hyperloop. So Hyperloop makes the French TGV basically look like a tinker toy. So the other day I was going to Station F in Paris, we were travelling at 324 kilometres an hour. These things start topping out at about 800 kilometres an hour, and the, those are the prototypes. They're just getting started. So these essentially are trains in a pod. You have a train in a vacuum tunnel, you get rid of air, they can travel at very, very fast speeds. Um, however, here is how they will be introduced into Dubai in 2021. So Dubai will have the world's first hyperloop network.
My name is Matthew Griffin, and I hope you enjoy your rocket ride. And as for me, I have to leave.